Good to see you. I'm Chris Collins, pastor to families, and uh, it is awesome to have you in church this morning. Uh, I want to say welcome to our multimedia church family today. If you're live streaming with us, you're in the engaged services, maybe you're podcasting or watching this on demand throughout the course of the week, you are a part of our church family. We are happy to have you. Thanks for being a part this morning or this week, whenever you might be watching this. Uh, Notes are available uh, off to this side of the screen. You can click on that. They'll drop down. You'll be able to follow along just as we are here in the main sanctuary. Um, It was quite a week around here. Uh, I don't know if any of you uh, made it through the microburst apocalyptic event on Tuesday that hit Oral Valley. Anybody get caught in that? My family, we left soccer practice just in the nick of time. Um, the, uh, the, the lightning bolt hit and we got out of there. But uh, our church actually sustained some, some pretty significant damage and you wouldn't know it because our team around here is just ridiculously good. But we actually have uh, a few photos. All in all, between our main campus here and our east campus, we lost 20 trees that just blew over uh, at their base. That tree right there was a tree that it had been around a long time because it was a big one. It's over by the church office. And just coincidentally, because God's just a God of coincidence, that just fell on a palm tree and not on either building right next to it. Uh, so we're grateful for that. Um, the, the shade sails that are out in the courtyard, those, half of those got blown away right there. And uh, it's my understanding that those shade sails are actually rated at about 90 miles an hour. So it's an indication that we probably had winds right here near our campus up over 100 miles an hour. And so tons of destruction, tons of things that, uh, that, got, that got destroyed. Well, incidentally, one thing that didn't get destroyed uh, was our, our banner. <laughs> That's built strong, folks. Yep. If you were wondering if this sermon series was of the Lord, wonder no more. <laughs> so that, that stayed up there. Um, there are a lot of people on this campus that, that do things that uh, you don't get to see throughout the course of the week. Uh, Monty, who runs kind of our office and uh, our business pastor, does an unbelievable job. Jim Vaughn takes care of our grounds around here. Jim probably worked 160 hours this week. I don't know if he slept. And the reason why you showed up today and you might have thought, yeah, they're I thought there was shade there at one time, but now there's not. It's because starting on Wednesday after the aftermath, Jim and his crew went to work. And so if you would just honor Jim and the, and the crew that kind of picked up this place this morning. <clears throat> Jim, I'm going to put in for a raise for you this week. I don't know if you're going to get it, but I'm going to put in for it. Uh, it, it's awesome to fill in for Pastor Craig. Him and Robin are away on a little vacation. I believe he's prepping for the NFL season. And uh, I was in the office this week getting ready uh, for, for this sermon and uh, doing some things. And I came across a photo kind of near his desk. I was in his office for a minute and uh, I think it was a photo from when he was a kid. And uh, he's asking his dad, dad, what's an end zone? And his dad had to tell him, I don't know, son, we're cowboys. So uh, he's, he's out in, in deep prayer, hoping for a great season, but uh, they're going to have to figure out what an end zone is. <laughs> By way of review this morning, <clears throat> we're in, <clears throat> excuse me, week three of four in a series called Built Strong. This is our attempt to try and narrow our focus just a little bit on four key foundations that we can build a solid life around. And in week one, Pastor Craig spoke about relational health, how to win in relationships, Specifically in our church, we believe the key to relational health is found in small groups, getting connected and plugged into a key group of people that you can do life with. There are no perfect people here. We are better together. You may remember him sharing this sentence, a a shared sorrow is half a sorrow and a shared joy is twice the joy. We believe that in our church, that we are better together. Week two, we spoke about physical health. How to live a life that honors God physically. Our physical health is not a, not a standalone proposition as it relates to worship of God. Stewarding and taking care of the one body that we get in this life. Honoring God with our food choices, our fitness plan, our overall physical activity, 
understanding that how we treat and honor our health and our physical body is an act of worship. In fact, it's such an emphasis for us during this season. We're offering a wellness workshop with our very own Dr. Joe Utash, and that's going to be on Saturday, August the 27th from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. Sign up online to get connected with that. We're going to start the conversation about how to, how to put that into practice, how to, how to work on great food choices and a fitness plan and rest and stress reduction and all of those things. You will not want to miss it. Sign up on the church, church website. It, it could really change your life. Next week, we're going to talk about emotional health. We're going to put you on the couch and we're going to get deep into the emotions of your life. How do we learn to listen to or ignore certain types of emotions that cause us to act in certain ways? How do we honor God with our emotions? Recognizing that, recognizing that emotions are a part of who we are and a part of life, learning how to deal with them as God has instructed. When we were looking at this series and trying to determine how to best break up the teaching, we knew this week that we needed our most spiritual staff member to preach. We're talking about spiritual health today, so we sent Craig on vacation, and I'm going to speak to you about that. Over the next few minutes, I want us to unpack three keys to spiritual health and fitness. Okay, I'm a spiritual strength and conditioning coach today. There's three areas that are vital when it comes to being built strong, specifically as it relates to your spiritual health and fitness. Anybody all in for the Olympics? Anybody's family? Our family is all in for the Olympics. We can't wait for it. Even in the, when the Winter Olympics come around, it's crazy. But we are, we're all in. We are an Olympic family. We've spent the last two weeks every evening on the couch. Kids get to go to bed late. I mean, we're watching the Olympics. And you know, we're watching things that I never even think about, like, like diving and ping pong and rowing and archery. And the stories behind the athletes and the competitors are really what draws me to the Olympics, it's what really drives the interest level for me. I'm so compelled by what some of these competitors have gone through in order for them to be able to represent their country in the Olympic Games. And some of them have made themselves great through countless hours and days and years of training. I think about 41-year-old Oksana Chusevitna. Maybe you saw her. She's from Uzbekistan, and she's competing in her seventh Olympics. That's seven I think the average Olympic lifespan is one, maybe two. She's now competing in her seventh Olympics. In her sport, she has long since passed her prime in gymnastics. In fact, she has a 17-year-old son, and, and he would be considered in his prime in gymnastics right now. But she has brought herself under strict discipline and training with one goal in mind, and she has not relented in her pursuit of it. She has made herself a seven-time Olympian. Now, others were born for greatness, physically gifted. And we all know some of those people, and they want to act like, yeah, I work really hard, and I bring myself under, under strict physical training. But the reality is, is they're just blessed. They're just gifted, and we're just like, get over yourself. You're just better than me, okay? You don't have to, you don't have to pretend like you work really hard at it. You're just good. I think of Michael Phelps, the greatest of all time. You know, if science and the swimming community were to get together and they were actually going to build a human being from scratch, perfectly built for swimming, that person would be Michael Phelps. His wingspan is 80 inches. That's four inches longer than his height of 6'4". His inseam is 30 inches. Now, by comparison, mine's 31 and I'm 5'11 and a half. 5'11 and a half. All right? What that means is that the proportion of his body, he has more, more torso than he does legs. And so what it means is that it gives him unmatched lower body power and leverage in the water. He wears a size 14 shoe and has 15% more range of motion in his ankles than the average human being, meaning that his feet are literally flippers. <laughs> his, his hand size is more in proportion to somebody who's approaching seven feet tall which means his, his hands are like paddles. He has double-jointed tendencies in his shoulders, elbows, and knees, meaning that his range of motion is unmatched by anybody in the sport. The average human being's resting heart rate is near 70 beats per minute. Michael Phelps checks in at 38. 
beats per minute. Meaning that his body can physically move more blood and oxygen during extreme physical challenge than the average human being. Michael Phelps was literally born to swim. So as we talk about fitness and training and conditioning of our body, we we typically have a set of expectations that come with that. We, We know that and we expect that training will be inconvenient. Most of, the, most of the time, training won't be fun, and, and probably it's going to hurt if you do it right. Training is not this typically fun activity. And if you have a scheduled workout time during the course of the week, you probably know that or you realize that. I, I like to work out on Sunday afternoons. I run into my buddy Jeff who goes to church here, and we see each other at the gym, and we just kind of, it's just eye contact like, yeah, this stinks, this hurts, like have a good workout, I'll talk to you later. It's not enjoyable. We have an expectation that's not going to be fun, but the benefits far outweigh the discomfort we feel in that moment. So I'm wondering this morning, do we have the same thought process and mindset when it comes to our spiritual fitness? The things you need to do, the things you need to understand or practice to maximize your potential to be Christ-like. Do you have a spiritual strength and conditioning plan? We put your mind and heart at ease this morning. The reason we were talking about Oksana and the reason we were talking about Michael Phelps is that when it comes to spiritual fitness, there is no Michael Phelps. There is nobody that was just born for godliness. We have to go back to original sin. And that's all we need to know. We sinned, sinned into the world. We were broken people. We became broken and selfish. And we have wicked little hearts and we need to be redeemed. We are bent towards those things. And while God continually woos us throughout our life, nobody is just born with spiritual fitness and spiritual giftedness. That is a learned discipline. There are no Michael Phelps. There are, however, a ton of Oksana Chusevitnas. Those of us that just work at it and work at it and work at it and we make ourselves into the person that we feel like Christ wants us to be. So I want us to be in a place to recognize that to be more Christ-like means we will need to bring ourselves under some strict discipline. We're going to have to work at it. We need that expectation. In fact, there's a fairly well-known passage of Scripture that we use all the time in the sports ministry world where it talks about this. It's in 1 Corinthians 9, 25 to 27, and it says this. Now, everyone who competes exercises self-control in everything. However, They do it to receive a perishable crown, but we an imperishable one. Therefore, I do not run like one who runs aimlessly, circle, highlight, underline aimlessly, or box like one who beats the air. Instead, I discipline my body and bring it under strict control so that after preaching to others, I myself will not be disqualified." So the application of this passage for us today is twofold. First, let's come to this understanding that spiritual fitness can fall under the instruction in this passage. I know specifically it's talking kind of about athletics and physical training, but the the analogy is there and it works and it's not out of context. To say if you want to be great at anything in this life, you're going to have to discipline yourself and work at it. Spiritual fitness is the result of spiritual disciplines. That's good, Chris. I worked hard on that one. Spiritual fitness is the result of spiritual disciplines. Too often, too often, sometimes, we in the church operate under the impression that we work out spiritually on Sundays. That that we come to the gym of spiritual fitness on Sundays. But the majority of the time, that workout usually consists of us watching somebody else work out. The preacher comes in after a week or two of strict discipline, presents something to you, and then we kind of think about it, and then by the time we get to El Molinito, we're like, Whew, I'm spent, what a workout today. <laughs> right, we've all been guilty of that, we all do that. So the idea is, how, how do we get spiritually fit Monday through Saturday? How do we get past this one day a week workout? So I wanna challenge our mindset today that our spiritual fitness will require training that we know and understand and expect will be inconvenient, it may not always be fun, and we know it might hurt if it's done right. 
And I know what you're thinking, like, well, if we're doing things of the Lord and spiritual fitness, how can it be uncomfortable and how can it be inconvenient? And we're going to make it practical today. We're, we're going to really make it practical about how we do that. The second application from that passage we read is that we need to have a strategy on how to get there. Verse 26 said that I do not run like one who runs aimlessly. Circle, underline, highlight, aimlessly. If you remember, aimlessly is this, this idea that we have no direction. If, if, if I would have thought about it before this morning, there's an unbelievable clip from, from Monty Python. It's like the track meet. I don't know if anybody's ever seen that clip. It's the track meet where nobody has any direction and they all line up on the starting line and the gun goes off and they all run in different directions. It's hilarious. You can look it up on YouTube. But that's sometimes how we are. We are, we are aimless in our spiritual fitness. We don't have a game plan sometimes. Spiritual fitness will be found by those who have a strategy on how to get there. So your first fill in the blank there. Spiritual fitness requires discipline and strategy. And so today, your spiritual fitness really is about UPS. So let's talk about UPS, the packaging company. Let's talk about logistics. My hope and my goal and my aim this morning is that you will never look at a UPS delivery truck the same way again. Because I want to give you three spiritual fitness keys this morning to help you better understand who God is in your life. And if you put these disciplines into strict discipline in your life, you'll be a spiritual Olympian. You'll obtain that imperishable crown that Paul's talking about in 1 Corinthians 9, the one that never goes away. So when we start with key number one, I believe it to be the most vital. And then key number two and three will build on that. So we'll kind of do key number one, outline it a little bit, and then key number two and three will help us get key number one a little bit better. So you have lots of room today to write. I believe God's going to reveal some things to you today that will get you spiritually fit. And here's the question I want to start with. It's a rhetorical question to help us build on this, and it's simply this. Who do you say I am? Jesus Christ asking us the question today, who do you say that I am? So the first key to spiritual fitness is this. Understand who God is. Understand who God is. A word synonymous with understanding is knowledge. We need to immediately point out the similarities between knowing and understanding. Here's the definition knowing, dictionary.com, 100% true, off the internet. <laughs> Affecting, implying, or deliberately revealing shrewd knowledge of secret or private information. Put another way, getting information that not everyone else knows about. So when I think about knowledge of God, I'm curious today if when we talk about that, we talk about scripture, if you think of it as a secret or private information. Knowing God, revealing secret or private information. I don't know that that sits well with us as, as far as that definition goes. One of the many traps that, that Christians can come into and get caught up in is this idea of intellectual assent. See, intellectual assent says that the more groups I go to, the more books I read, the more I study, the more I read books about people who have read the God, the God of the Bible, and are telling me what they think about it, the more I know about God. That if I just kind of study it and I podcast it, that the more knowledge I have, this intellectual sin, the closer I am to God. And if we're not careful, it becomes a trap. I hope I'm going to be able to prove that to you with this because the definition of understanding says that it is superior power of discernment or enlightened intelligence. If knowledge equals intelligence, understanding needs to bring some sort of enlightenment. What are we going to do with it? What are we going to do with all the knowledge we have? So if knowledge, unlocking the secret, nobody else knows about, if that's the first stop on our journey, then understanding has to be the final destination. To understand who God is in our world, around us, and in our life. 2 Peter 1, 5-9 says this, For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with goodness, goodness with knowledge, knowledge with self-control, self-control with endurance, 
endurance with godliness, godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they will keep you from being useless or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So if I were taking notes today, just for instance, I would underline or highlight or circle being useless or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is a powerful passage as it relates to knowledge and understanding. See, knowledge by itself is useless. However, knowledge is key to understanding. So knowledge is only as valuable as what you do with it. Okay? Even G.I. Joe said that knowing was half the battle. There's still another half somewhere. So we gotta, we gotta get there. We gotta figure it out. So let's make sure we know who God is today. Let's start there. Let's get some base knowledge of who he is, some facts. Do you know him today? Think about it. Who is he to you? Who is he in scripture? What knowledge do you have or what understanding do you have of Christ today? Who do you say that he is? Better yet, if we walked out of this building and we met somebody at lunch, how would you describe Jesus? Let me remind you of who Jesus Christ is today on the knowledge side of things. See, the Bible says that my king is the king of the Jews. He's the king of Israel. He's the king of righteousness. He's the king of the ages. He's the king of heaven. And he's the king of glory. He's the king of kings and he's the Lord of lords. That's our king. My king is a sovereign king. No means of measure can define his limitless love. He's enduringly strong. He's entirely sincere. He's eternally steadfast. He's immortally graceful. He's imperially powerful. He's impartially merciful. Do you know him? He's the greatest phenomenon that has ever crossed the horizon of this world. He's God's son. He's the sinner's savior. He's the centerpiece of civilization. He's unparalleled. He's unprecedented. He's the loftiest idea in literature. He's the highest personality in all of philosophy. He's the fundamental doctrine of true theology. He's the one and only person qualified to be an all-sufficient savior. He supplies strength for the weak. He's available for the tempted and the tried. He sympathizes and he saves. He strengthens and sustains. He guards and he guides. He heals the sick. He cleans the lepers. He forgives sinners. He discharges debtors. He delivers captives. He defends the feeble. He blesses the young. He serves the unfortunate. He regards the aged. He rewards the diligent. He beautifies the meek. Do we know who he is today? He's the key to knowledge. He's the wellspring of wisdom. He's the doorway of deliverance. He's the pathway of peace, the roadway of righteousness. He's the highway of holiness. He's the gateway of glory. His life is matchless. His goodness is limitless. His mercy is everlasting. His love never changes. His word is enough. His grace is sufficient. His reign is righteous. His yoke is easy and his burden is light. I wish I could describe him to you. But he's, he's indescribable. See, he's incomprehensible. He's invincible. He's irresistible. You can't get him out of your mind. You can't outlive him, and you can't live without him. The Pharisees couldn't stand him, but they found out they couldn't stop him. Pilate couldn't find any fault in him. Herod couldn't kill him. Death couldn't handle him. And the grave couldn't hold him. That is your king today. And that covers every single person within the sound of my voice. That, that's our king. And if you don't know this king, we want you to know him today. So now that we know a little bit about him, we have some facts about him, we can begin to move toward understanding him. And one of the best examples of the, the, the dynamic there, the, the, the transition we have to make is, is found in the New Testament and how the Pharisees handled their relationship with Christ. See, the Pharisees knew Christ. 
The problem was they never made it to the final destination of understanding the essence of who he was. They never allowed their intelligence to be enlightened by him. Matthew 23, it's this powerful chapter with the heading above it says this, religious hypocrites denounced. Jesus is speaking to his disciples and the crowd that followed him at this point. And eight times in this chapter, Jesus says these words, woe to you. And what he's saying to the Pharisees, the religious leaders of the day, the pastors, the evangelists, the missionaries, professional followers of God, woe to you because you only have knowledge of the facts of God. But you do not understand the essence of who God is. And therefore, you do not understand the essence of me, Jesus Christ, your Savior, your King, the King with all the attributes we just described. So in Matthew 23, verse 2 through 7, Christ says this to the scribes and the Pharisees. The scribes and the Pharisees are seated in the chair of Moses. Therefore, do whatever they tell you and observe it. But don't practice what they teach. They tie up heavy loads that are hard to carry and put them on people's shoulders. But they themselves aren't willing to lift a finger to move them. They do everything to be observed by others. They enlarge their phylacteries and lengthen their tassels. They love the place of honor at banquets, the front seats in the synagogues, greetings in the marketplace, and to be called rabbi by people. Now, let, I'll admit, I think the Pharisees sometimes get a bad rap because I do believe they truly loved God. I mean, they committed their lives to serving him. So we, we, we probably just need to recognize that I do think they were trying. The problem was that they turned following God into an intellectual contest. Here's the list of do's and don'ts. Here's all the things you should do and shouldn't do. And we're gonna be the ones that police that. And Jesus calls them out in this entire chapter. I mean, if you could stand there, he, I mean, he's giving it to them. He's absolutely just undressing them in front, of, in front of all the disciples and all these followers. It's not a pleasant moment to be a Pharisee. Just for explanation, phylacteries were small wooden boxes that were placed on their foreheads and they contained tiny pieces of parchment that had scripture written on them. And it was a, a visual to the people that I, I've got the word of God literally on my mind. It goes back to an Old Testament scripture that says to keep these, keep these words on your mind, keep these words literally on your forehead. And so they did that. And they walked around with the appearance that they were real heavenly minded. I literally have the word of God on my forehead. The long tassels indicated their knowledge and remembrance of the covenant and commandments of the Old Testament. So they made them obnoxiously long to tell everyone, hey, we're committed. Check out the tassels. Put in modern language, the Pharisees loved to go to church on Sunday and small group and Bible studies. And they desire all the knowledge they can find in those settings. But they didn't understand it's not just about pretending to be like Jesus that matters. It's understanding the essence of who he is. If you want to understand God, you must read his book. Scripture is the only way for us to gain the knowledge of who he is so that we can journey to the destination of understanding how he moves in our life. This is a bunch of facts, and when you read them, it jumps off the page, it gets in your heart, it gets in your mind, and then the Holy Spirit gets to come in and bring you understanding. So if you want to be spiritually fit and healthy, it starts with understanding who God is. And then you ask the question, well, how do we do that? How, how do we put that into practice? How do we make that happen? How do we gain understanding of God? And I love it when you ask questions that match my notes. It tells me we're on the same page. And the second key to spiritual fitness on the backside of your notes is proximity to God. Proximity to God. Definition, if you, if you haven't figured it out, I'm a definition guy. I kind of, I nerd out on that stuff a little bit. Proximity is this, nearness in place, time, occurrence, or relation. Now, as I was studying this, I, it never really, I never really thought about this application of relation when it comes to proximity. I just thought it generally meant how close is something to something else, right? An object. Well, there's a relationship component to proximity that is, that, that's in play as well. 
And it struck me, and I, I thought, man, what about the little things in relationships? Or what about the little things as it relates to our proximity? Have you ever thought about how things might be different if they were just a little bit off? Just, just a little bit. Your proximity was just a little bit off or the aim or the direction was not quite where it needed to be. There, there's this concept in aviation, it, it's called the one degree rule. And it says that if you are just one degree off of your trajectory, your intended destination, the disaster could strike. So if we put it into terms we can understand, if, if we're all in a plane in New York City and we take off flying towards LA and our, our gauge is off just one degree from where we wanna go, about the time you think you're landing in LA, you're actually 40 miles into the Pacific Ocean. One degree off not just gonna be close enough. Little things matter. Proximity matters, your aim matters. And, and one of my convictions is that I often view my proximity to God in these terms. I'm close enough. I make it to church enough. I volunteer enough. I give enough money, I donate enough. I'm close enough to the person I want to be. I'm telling you today, God desires to be in close proximity to us. And he wants us to be in his presence, not just close enough. We really need to look no further than the example of Jesus Christ. When he was on this planet, it tells us in Luke 5, verse 16, yet he often withdrew to deserted places and prayed. He often withdrew. When's the last time you remember withdrawing somewhere to be close to God? I remember a few weeks ago, I had such a moment. I was in Colorado Springs at Glen Erie. Glen Erie is the campground and retreat center for the navigators. It's actually right next door to the Garden of, Garden of Gods there in, in Colorado Springs, and it is a stunning place. I mean, beauty virtually undescribable. Castle-like buildings. It seems like they were built hundreds of years ago. Trees and green grass and wildlife, and they got bald eagles and, 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 and bear. They're pretty to see from a distance. Deer and everything. I mean, just unbelievable, indescribable beauty. And there was a moment in between one of the sessions of the retreat when I was there where I kind of just sat and I overlooked uh, an open area, and, and I looked across the way, and I saw one of these castle-like buildings kind of set against the backdrop of the mountains and white clouds against blue sky. And I just had to think for a moment of how incredible God is, just stunning natural beauty. And I had that moment. You know why I remember that? Because I withdrew on purpose. And you know why I'm convicted about it? It's because it's the last time I did it. See, I, I, I have a struggle in my own life withdrawing to find time in places like this, to get in proximity where God can do something and say something to me that he can't tell me in the midst of a crowded mall. Now, don't get me wrong theologically. God can speak to us anytime, anywhere. He's always with us. He never leaves us nor forsakes us. I understand that. But I'm literally talking about the opportunity we have to get somewhere where we can receive something that we normally would not receive from God. And the example that Christ set time and time again was that you need to get away from things that keep you from connecting with God. To be in close proximity, to be near to God will require us to rid ourselves of distraction and get to an isolated place where we give him full access. No obligations, no requirements, no distractions. There's a powerful example in the book of Habakkuk of what this looks like. And I, 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 I was hesitant to speak uh, about this passage because I had trouble pronouncing Habakkuk, but I worked on it. I feel like I can say Habakkuk over and over. It's a really hard word. But his name literally means to embrace or wrestle. And the book of Habakkuk starts out with him wrestling with this question. If you are real, God, why do all these bad things happen? Where are you? Why are you so indifferent to the suffering all around me? 
Habakkuk 2.1 says this, powerful, I will stand at my guard post and station myself on the lookout tower. I will watch to see what he will say to me and what I should reply about my complaint. This is Habakkuk's way of saying, I'm going to get alone and close to God. I'm gonna have a chat with him. I'm gonna get in close proximity to him. And it's that intentional, disciplined approach that changed his entire spiritual fitness. See, by the end of this very short book of the Bible, Habakkuk has transitioned from worry and doubt to worship. He committed to petition God with, that, with what was troubling his spirit, but he also committed to finding a place where God could explain himself. And he withdrew and he went to this tower so he could get close to God. Listen, there is no magic in the place you choose. There's no magic in the place. The magic is in your desire and discipline to be near God. Find a place, any place. If, if you want to go prayer room movie style and clear out a closet and, and just go in there, then do it. Go for it. If you want to rise at dawn and hang out Catalina State Park, you should do that. If, if you want to throw a blanket down and gaze up at the stars in the evening and actually get to co have a conversation with the, the very person that spoke those stars into existence, then do that. But find a place to get in close proximity to God. The Celtic Christians use a term called thin places. And this term thin places is used to describe places where they couldn't really figure out if heaven and earth were separated, places where, where literally heaven and earth collided. And we've probably all been there. I happen to think we have a thin place when we look out the window behind me. It's this, it's this mountain that, that is, that's unbelievable and, and you look at it and you think, man, God spoke that into existence. It's incredible. But it's a thin place and, and, and we have to find the thin places where we can meet God because he's waiting on us. Proximity is important. The third key to spiritual fitness, UPS, understanding who God is, proximity to him, and the S right here, be still. Be still. Matthew 6, 6 to 8 says this, but when you pray, go into your private room, shut your door, and pray to your father who is in secret, and your father who sees in secret will, will reward you. When you pray, don't babble, circle, highlight, underline, babble, like the idolaters, since they imagine they'll be heard for their many words. Don't be like them, because your father knows the things you need before you ask him. Such a powerful passage, and it really encapsulates the need for proximity and stillness. But, but I want to focus on the portion that says to get away and not to babble. Remember that prayer is conversation. So if you aren't listening, then, then that means you're probably not still at some point. Stillness of mind, stillness of words, stillness of body, stillness of spirit to allow God to say something. Allow the other person in the conversation to respond. Otherwise, you're just giving a speech. I don't know if God needs my speech because I just read he already knows what I need before I ask. So it begs the question, well, what's prayer for? Maybe prayer is just as important for God to have access to speak to us as it is for us to bring petitions and thanksgiving to him. To be still is an important part of that. Earl Nightingale said this, he's considered the dean of personal development. Open your ears before you open your mouth for it may surprise your eyes. Be still, it will change your perspective. And so often we want to fill the air with words and we, we want God to respond. We got to give him a chance. Some of you aren't convinced, so here's another one. Knowledge speaks things you know. Knowledge speaks, but wisdom listens. That's from the great philosopher Jimi Hendrix. And he was probably high when he said that. But it's still pretty good. And it's still true. God doesn't need a speech from us. 
Wisdom says, I'll be still because we just read, he knows what we want before we even ask it. So what he needs from us in that conversation is the opportunity to speak. He responds in our stillness. I'm not sure, I can't back this up theologically, so save me the emails. I don't know if God's interested in shouting over me. I think he'd like me to give him an opportunity to respond and be still. You know, I just discovered this feature on my phone. It's called Do Not Disturb. You, you, have, you actually can, you can set your phone to not bother you. It's life-changing. So I can't get an email or a text message from you after a certain period of time at night and before a certain period of time in the morning. And what I've, what I've basically said is that I am going to, to, to pull myself back from that device and everything that's involved with that, and I'm going to do some other things. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take away something so that I can do something else. And stillness might require you to do that. You might have to take away something in order to get still. But I promise you, if you don't get intentional about being still, it will not happen. It's not in our DNA. It's not American. It's not American to be still. When's the last time somebody asked you how you were doing and you responded with, man, I've been still. <laughs> no way. We respond with, I've been busy. Everybody's busy, right? All the retired folks in our church are busier now than they were when they're working. It's unbelievable. We are all so busy. We gotta be still. In our world, in our culture, by our nature, stillness before God will not happen unless you make a decision to make it happen. So now that we know about UPS, understanding proximity and stillness, now that we have a small idea about how to live out 1 Corinthians 9, to have a strategy and a training plan to win an imperishable crown, how does that affect my life? What do I do with UPS, Chris? Why does that matter? I asked you a key question before we started. Who do you say that I am? What is the key question to assess my spiritual fitness? Who do you say that I am? And this is where the strategy of UPS comes in. Mark 8, 27 through 30 says this. Jesus went out with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi and on the road he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they answered him, John the Baptist, others Elijah, still others one of the prophets. But you, he asked them again, who do you say that I am? The reality is this today, God's asking you the question, who do you say that I am? The truth of the matter is our answer to that question will determine the trajectory of our life. It will determine the decisions that we make. It will determine the places that we go, the relationships that we keep. And we can make a decision today to get spiritually fit, and it's as simple as UPS. Understand who God is, not just know some things about him. Find a time and a place to be in close proximity to him and create space to be still in his presence. And that may seem like an unbelievably tough task today, but 1 Corinthians 9 told us that we are in training for an imperishable crown, strict discipline. So it's time for us to formulate our strategy and our game plan to get spiritually fit. It will not happen on its own. It will not happen only on Sunday morning. So here's the first workout in the plan. I'm gonna give it to you. The bottom of your your page there, who do you say that I am? Prayer focus above a circle. I want everybody to write their name in that circle. Rodney Gypsy Smith was born on the outskirts of London in 1860. He never received a formal education, yet he lectured at Harvard Despite his humble origins, he was invited by two sitting United States presidents to the White House. Gypsy crisscrossed the Atlantic Ocean 45 times, preaching the gospel to millions of people, and he never preached without someone surrendering their life to the lordship of Jesus Christ. Gypsy was powerfully used by God. 
Everywhere he went, it seemed like revival was right on his heels. And it was never his preaching that brought revival. See, preaching may move the hearts of men, but it's prayer that moves the heart of God. And that's where revival comes from. Gypsy revealed his secret to a delegation of revival seekers who sought an audience with him. They wanted to know how they could make a difference with their lives and to understand God the way he did. His response was simple yet profound and as timely today as it was 100 plus years ago. He gave them this advice. Go home. Lock yourself in your room. Kneel down in the middle of the floor. And with a piece of chalk, draw a circle around yourself. And there on your knees, pray fervently and brokenly that God would start a revival in that circle. The strategy of understanding and proximity and stillness is going to increase your spiritual fitness. It has to start with praying that God would bring revival to your heart. Let's pray. God, we're grateful to be in your presence this morning. I'm grateful that you left us a game plan the inspired word of God that's living and breathing now thousands of years after it was pinned and it's applicable for us today. I pray for revival in hearts that as we draw a circle around ourselves and we pray that we might have better understanding, that we might be better in touch with you and the essence of who you are, that our proximity to you would be close and that we would be still in your presence so that you might speak to us, that it would change us from the inside out and it would influence those around us. God, I pray for those that might be in the room this morning that do not have a relationship with you. They've come to this place and uh, they've come with a friend or you're still drawing them unto you. We pray that this morning they might make a decision for you. And if you're here this morning and you wanna make that decision for Jesus Christ, it's as simple as saying this prayer. Heavenly Father, forgive me for my sins. I submit my heart and my life to you. I pray that you would draw me close to you. I pray that I would gain knowledge and understanding. I would be in close proximity and I would be still in front of you so that you might change my life. That I might know all of the attributes that are the king of kings and the Lord of lords. That you are the savior this morning. I pray that as we leave this place, we would be inspired to make a difference. I pray that our spiritual fitness, Lord, would be, would be such that, that we would be Olympian in our effort. I pray that you would bless us and keep us safe. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.